As we join the story, we find the Greeks in trouble. Achilles has been sitting out the war and has withheld his Myrmidons from battle. The Trojans have gained the upper hand and the Greeks have withdrawn behind the wooden palisade that encircles their camp, and the Trojans are pressing them hard. For all this, though, Hector and his Trojans would never have broken the barred gate had not Zeus roused his own son Sarpedon against the Greeks as a lion against cattle. Sarpedon held before him a perfect shield, its bronze skin hammered smooth by the smith who had stitched the leather beneath with gold all around the rim. Holding the shield and brandishing two spears, Sarpedon advanced. The mountain lion is not fed for days and is hungry and brave enough to enter the stone sheep pen and attack the flocks. Even if he finds herdsmen on the spot with dogs and spears to protect the fold, he will not be driven back without a try, and either he leaps in and seizes a sheep, or is killed by a spear, as human heroes are. Godlike Sarpedon felt impelled to rush the wall and tear it down. He turned to Glaucus and said, Glaucus, you know how you and I have the best of all things in Lycia? Seats, full cups, cuts of meat, everybody looking at us as if we were gods. Not to mention our estates on Exanthus, fine orchards and riverside wheat fields. Well, now we have to take our stand at the front, where all the best fight and face the heat of battle, so that many an armored Lycian will say, so they are not inglorious after all. Our Lycian lords who eat fat sheep and drink the sweetest wine know they are strong, and they fight with our best. My friend, if you and I could only get out of this war alive and then be immortal and ageless all of our days, I would never again fight among the foremost or send you into battle to win me my glory. But as it is, death is everywhere, in more shapes than we can count, and since no mortal is immune or can escape, let us go forward, either to give glory to another man or to take glory from him. Glaucus nodded and the two of them moved out at the head of a great nation of Lycians. Menestius, Peteus' son, saw them and shuddered, for they were advancing towards his part of the wall and bringing ruin with them. Menestius looked along the wall for a Greek captain who could save his company from disaster, and he saw both Ajaxes, who never seemed to tire, and Tilka, who had just come from his hut. They were near enough, but there was no way to make a shout reach them, not with all the noise filling the air the crash of shields and helmets and the pounding on the gates, which were all closed now and before each one of which the enemy stood, trying their best to break them and enter. So Menestius turned to the herald Thuotes. Run Thuotes and call Ajax or Bidiot, call them both. All hell is going to break loose here. The Lycian leaders are bearing down on us and they've been awfully tough in the big battles. The fighting is too heavy for both of them to come. At least get Telamonian Ajax here, and Tukatu, who was good with a bow. And the herald was off, running along the wall until he came to the two Ajaxes to whom he said, My lords, Ajax, captains of the Achaeans, the son of Peteus, nurtured of Zeus, bid you come make a stand, however briefly, in the battle there. Both of you would be best, since all hell is going to break loose. The Lycian leaders are bailing down on us, and they've been awfully tough in the big battles. If the fighting is too heavy for both of you to leave, at least let Telamonian Ajax come and took a two who is good with a bow. Telamonian Ajax heard the herald out, and turned to his Olean counterpart. Ajax, stay here with Lycomedes and keep these Danaeans in the fight. I'm going to make a stand over there. When I've helped them out, I'll come back. Big Ajax left, and with him Tuka, his natural brother, and Pandion, who carried Tuka's curved bow. Moving along the inside of the wall, they came to Menestius's sector and to men hard-pressed. The Lycians were swarming up the battlements like black wind. The Greeks pushed back with a shout, and in the fighting that ensued, it was Telamonian Ajax who first killed his man, Sarpedon's comrade Epicles, 
hitting him with a jagged piece of marble that lay on top of the heap of stones inside the wall there. You couldn't find a man alive now who could lift that stone with both hands. But Ajax swung it high and hurled it with enough force to shatter the four-horned helmet and crush Epicles' skull inside. He fell, as if he were doing a high dive from the wall, and his spirit left his bones. Then Tuca hit a fast-charging Glaucus with an arrow where he saw his arm exposed. This stopped him cold, and he leapt back from the wall, hiding his wound from Greek eyes and his pride from their taunts. But it didn't take away any of his fight. He hit Alcamean, son of Thester, with his spear, jabbing it in, and as he pulled it out again, Alcamean came forward with it, falling headfirst and landing with a clatter of finely tooled bronze. Sarpedon wrapped his hand around the battlement and pulled. The whole section gave way, exposing the wall above and making an entrance for many. Ajax and Tuca attacked him together. Tuca's arrow hit his shield's bright belt where it slung across his chest, but Zeus beat off the death spirits. He would not let his son fall by the ships. Big Ajax leapt upon him at the same moment, thrusting his spear into Sarpedon's shield but could not push the point through. He did make him reel backward, though. Sarpedon collected himself a short distance back from the wall. He was not giving up. His heart still hoped to win glory here. Wheeling around, he called to his godlike Lickens, Lickens, why are you slacking off from the fight? Do you think I can knock this wall down alone and clear a path to the ships? Help me out here. The more men we have, the better the work will go. The Lickians cowered before their warlord's rebuke, then tightened their ranks around him even more. The Greeks strengthened their positions on the wall and steeled themselves for a major battle. For all their strength, the Lycians were unable to break the wall, nor could the Greek spearmen push them back once they were close in. They fought at close quarters, like two men, disputing boundary stones in a common field and defending their turf with the measuring rods they had brought with them to stake their claims. Likewise, the Trojans and Greeks, separated by the palisade and reaching over it to hack away at each other's leather shields. Many were wounded, mostly those who turned their unprotected backs to the enemy, but many threw their shields too, until the whole wooden wall dripped with the blood of soldiers from both sides. The Trojans could do nothing to drive the Greeks back. An honest woman who works with her hands to bring home a meager wage for her children will balance a weight of wool in her scales until both pans are perfectly level. So too this battle. Until Zeus exalted Priam's son Hector first to penetrate the Achaean wall. His shout split the air. Move, Trojans! Let's tear down this Greek fence and make a bonfire out of their ships. They heard him, all right, and swarmed right up the wall, climbing to its pickets with spears in their hands, while Hector scooped up a stone that lay by the gates, a massive boulder tapering to a point. It would take two men to heave it into a cart, more than two as men are now. But Hector handled it easily alone. Zeus lightened it for him, so that the stone was no more to Hector than the fleece of a ram is to a shepherd who carries it easily in his free hand. This was how Hector carried it up to the gates, a set of heavy double doors, solidly built and bolted shut by interlocked inner bars. Standing close to these towering doors, Hector spread his feet to get his weight behind the throw and smashed the stone right into the middle. The hinges broke off, and the stone's momentum carried it through, exploding the doors and sending splintered wood in every direction. Hector jumped through, a spear in each hand. His face was like sudden night, and a dark gold light played about the armor that encased his zealous bones. No one could have stopped him except the gods in his immortal leap through the ruined gate, and his eyes glowed with fire. Wheeling around in the throng, Hector called to his Trojans, who needed no persuasion, to scale the wall. Those who couldn't swarmed through the gate, and the Greeks, en route to their hollow ships, with a noise like the damned stampeded into hell. Hector was making good on his promise to burn the Greek ships, when Patroclus came to Achilles and stood by him weeping, his face like a sheer rock where the goat trails end, and dark spring water washes down the stone. Achilles pitied him and spoke these feathered words. What are all these tears about, Patroclus? You're like a little girl pestering her mother to pick her up. 
pulling at her hem as she tries to hurry off and looking up at her with tears in her eyes until she gets her way. That's just what you look like, you know. You have something to tell the Myrmidons, or myself, bad news from back home? Last I heard, Minotius, your father, and Peleus mine, were still alive and well. Their deaths would indeed give us cause to grieve. Or are you broken-hearted because some Greeks are being beaten dead beside our ships? They had it coming. Out with it, Patroclus, don't try to hide it, I have a right to know. And with a deep groan, Patroclus said to him, Achilles, great as you are, don't be vengeful. They're dying out there. All of our best, or who used to be our best, they've all been hit and are lying wounded in camp. Diomedes is out, and Odysseus, a good man with a spear, even Agamemnon has taken a hit. Eurypylus too, an arrow in his thigh. The medics are working on them right now, stitching up their wounds. But you, you are incurable, Achilles. God forbid I ever feel the spite you nurse in your heart. You and your damned honor. What good will it do future generations if you let us go down to this defeat in cold blood? Peleus was never your father, nor Thetis your mother, nor the grey seas spat you out onto crags in the surf with an icy scab for a soul. What is it? If some secret your mother has learned from Zeus is holding you back, at least send me out. Let me lead a troop of Myrmidons and light the way for our army. Let me wear your armor. If the Trojans think I am you, they'll back off and give the Greeks some breathing space, what little there is in war. Our rested men will turn them with a shout and push them back from our ships to Troy. That was how Patroclus, like a child begging for a toy, begged for death. And Achilles, angry and deeply troubled, my noble friend, what a thing to say. No, I am not in on any divine secret. Nor has my mother told me anything from Zeus, but I take it hard when someone in power uses his authority to rob his equal and strip him of his honor. I take it hard. The girl the Greeks chose to be my prize after I demolished a walled city to get her, Lord Agamemnon, son of Atreus, just took from my hands as if I were some tramp. But we'll let that be. I never meant to hold my grudge forever, but I did say I would not relent from my anger until the noise of battle lapped at my own ship's hulls. So it's on your shoulders now. Wear my armor and lead our Myrmidons into battle. If it is true that a dark cloud of Trojans has settled in over the ships and the Greeks are hemmed in on a narrow strip of beach, the Trojans have become cocky. The whole city, because they do not see my helmeted face flaring close by. They would retreat so fast they would clog the ditches with their dead if Lord Agamemnon knew how to respect me. As it is, they have brought the war to our camp. So Diomedes is out. It was his inspired spearwork that kept the Trojans at arm's length. And I haven't been hearing Agamemnon's battle cry as much as I hate the throat it comes from. Only Hector's murderous shout breaking like the sea over the Trojans urging them on. The whole plain is filled with their whooping as they rout the Greeks. Hit them hard, Patroclus, before they burn the ships and leave us stranded here. But before you go, listen carefully to every word I say. Win me my honor, my glory and my honor from all the Greeks, and as their restitution, the girl Briseis and many other gifts. But once you've driven the Trojans back from the ships, you come back, no matter how much Hera's thundering husband lets you win. Any success you have against the Trojans will be at the expense of my honor. And if you get so carried away with killing the Trojans that you press on to Troy, one of the immortals may intervene. Apollo, for one, loves them dearly. So once you have made some daylight for the ships, you come back where you belong. Let the others fight it out on the plain. O Patroclus, I wish to Father Zeus, and to Athena and Apollo, that all of them, Greeks and Trojans alike, every last man on Troy's dusty plain were dead, and only you and I were left to rip Ilion down stone by sacred stone. And so Patroclus asked, putting on the bronze metalwork tailored to the body of Aeacus's swift grandson. The greaves trimmed with silver at the ankles, the corslets spangled with stars, the silver-studded sword, the massive shield and the crested helmet that made every nod a threat. He took two spears of the proper heft, but left behind the massive battle pike of Aeacus's incomparable grandson. No one but Achilles could handle that spear, 
made of ash, which the centaur Chiron had brought down from Mount Pelion and given to Achilles' father to be the death of heroes. Patroclus left the horses to Automedon, the warrior he trusted most after Achilles to be at his side in the crush of battle. Meanwhile, Achilles tore the rows of huts that composed the Myrmidon's camp and saw to it that the men got armed. Think of wolves, ravenous for meat. It is impossible to describe their savage strength in the hunt, but after they have killed an antlered stag up in the hills and torn it apart, they come down with gore on their jowls, and in a pack go to lap the black surface water in a pool, fed by a dark spring. And as they drink, crimson curls float off from their slender tongues, but their hearts are still, and their bellies gorged. So too the Myrmidon commands. Flanking Achilles' splendid surrogate, and in their midst stood Achilles himself, urging on the horses and men. When Achilles had the troops assembled by battalions, he spoke to them bluntly. Myrmidons, I would not have any man among you forget the threats you have been issuing against the Trojans from the safety of our camp while I was in my rage. All this time you have been calling me the hard-boiled son of Peleus, and saying to my face that my mother must have weaned me on Gaul, but I wouldn't keep my friends from battle. That, together with hints you'd sail back home if all I was going to do was sit and sulk. Now, however, that there is a major battle to hold your interest, I hope that each one of you remembers what it means to fight. The speech steeled their spirit. The Myrmidons closed ranks until there was no more space between them than between the stones a mason sets in the wall of a high house when he wants to seal it from the wind. Helmet on helmet. Shield overlapping shield, man on man, so close the horsehair plumes on their bright crests rubbed each other as their heads bobbed up and down. And in front of them all, two men with one heart, Patroclus and Automedon, made their final preparations to lead the Myrmidons into war. But Achilles went back to his hut, and opened the lid of a beautiful carved chest his mother Thetis had put aboard his ship when he sailed for Troy, filled with tunics and cloaks and woolen rugs. And in it too was a chalice that no one else ever drank from, and that he alone used for libation to no other god but Zeus. This chalice he now took from the chest, purified it with sulfur crystals, washed it with clear water, then cleansed his hands and filled it with bright red wine. And then he prayed. Standing in his courtyard, pouring out the wine as he looked up to heaven, and as he prayed, Zeus, in his thunderhead, listened. Lord Zeus, as you have heard my prayer before and did honor me and smite the Achaeans, so now too fulfill my prayer. As I wait in the muster of the ships and send my Patroclus into battle with my men, send forth glory with him. Make bold the heart in his breast, so that Hector will see that my comrade knows how to fight and win without me. And when he has driven the noise of battle away from our ships, may he come back to me, unharmed with all his weapons and men. Zeus, in his wisdom, heard Achilles' prayer and granted half of it. Yes, Patroclus would drive the Trojans back from the ships, but he would not return from battle unharmed. Achilles placed the chalice back in the chest and stood outside his hut. He still longed to see the grim struggle in Troy's wind-swept plain. The Myrmidons under Patroclus filed out and swarmed up to the Trojans. Boys will sometimes disturb a hornet's nest by the roadside, jabbing at it and infuriating the hive, the little fools, until the insects become a menace to all and attack any traveller who happens by, swarming out in defense of their brood. So too the Myrmidons. Patroclus called to them over their shouts, Remember whose men you are and for whose honor you are fighting and fight so that even our great lord Agamemnon will recognize his blind folly in not honoring the best of all the Achaeans. For Achilles! This raised their spirits even higher. And they were all over the Trojans, and the ship's hulls reverberated with the sounds of their battle cries. The Trojans, when they saw Patroclus gleaming in his armor, fell apart. Convinced that Achilles had come out at last, his wrath renounced and solidarity restored. Seeing this, the Trojans lost stomach for the fight and fell into disorderly retreat. Sarpedon saw his gallant men running, with their tunics flapping loose around their waists and being swatted down like flies by Patroclus. He called out, appealing to their sense of shame. Why this sudden burst of speed, Lycian heroes? 
Slow down a little while I make the acquaintance of this nuisance of a Greek, who seems by now to have hamstrung half the Trojan army. And he stepped down from his chariot in his bronze as Patroclus, seeing him, leapt down from his. High above a cliff, vultures are screaming in the air as they savage each other's claws with their hooked beaks and talons. And higher still, Zeus watched with pity as the two heroes closed, and said to his wife Hera, who was his sister too, Fate has it that Sarpedon, whom I love more than any man, is to be killed by Patroclus. Shall I take him out of battle while he still lives, and set him down in the rich land of Lycia, or shall I let him die under Patroclus's hands? And Hera, his lady, her eyes soft and wide, Son of Cronus, what a thing to say! A mortal man whose fate has long been fixed, and you want to save him from rattling death. Do it. But don't expect all of us to approve. Listen, if you send Sarpedon home alive, you will have to expect other gods to do the same and save their own sons. And there are many of them in this war around Priam's great city. Think of the resentment you will create. But if you love him and are filled with grief, let him fall in battle at Patroclus's hands, and when the breath has left his lips, send sleep and death to bear him away to Lycia his people will give him burial with mound and stone as befits the dead. The father of gods and men agreed reluctantly, but shed drops of blood as rain upon the earth in honor of his own dear son, whom Patroclus was about to kill on Ilion's rich soil far from his native land. When they were close, Patroclus cast, and hit not Prince Sarpedon, but his lieutenant Thrasymelus, a good man, a hard throw into the pit of his belly. He collapsed in a heap, Sarpedon countered and missed. His bright spear sliced instead through the right shoulder of Pedasus, Patroclus's trace horse. This faultless animal, though mortal, had kept pace with Achilles' immortal horses. He now gave one pained, rasping whinny, then fell in the dust. With the trace horse down, the remaining two struggled in the creaking yoke, tangling the reins. Automedon remedied this by drawing his sword and cutting loose the trace horse. The other two righted themselves and pulled hard at the reins, and the two warriors closed again in mortal combat. Sarpedon cast again, another miss. The spear point glinted as it sailed over Patroclus's left shoulder without touching him at all. Patroclus came back, leaning into his throw, and the bronze point caught Sarpedon just below the ribcage where it protects the beating heart. Sarpedon fell as a tree falls. Oak or poplar or spreading pine when carpenters cut it down in the forest with their bright axes to be the beam of a ship. And he lay before his horses and chariot, groaning heavily and clawing the bloody dust. Like some tawny, spirited bull, a lion has killed in the middle of the shambling herd, groaning as it dies beneath the predator's jaws. Thus beneath Patroclus the Lycian commander struggled in death. And he called his friend Glaucus. It's time to show what you're made of and be the warrior you've always been. Heart set on evil war, if you're fast enough. Hurry, rally our best fight for my body, or the Lycian leaders. Shame on you, Glaucus, until your dying day if the Greeks strip my body bare beside their ships. Be strong and keep the others going. The end came as he spoke, and death settled on his nostrils and eyes. Patroclus put his heel on Sarpedon's chest and pulled out his spear. The lungs came out with it, and Sarpedon's life. Glaucus could hardly bear to hear Sarpedon's voice. He was so grieved he could not save him. He pressed his arm with his hand. His wound tormented him. He prayed to Apollo, lord of bright distances. Hear me, O lord, wherever you are in Lycia or Troy, for everywhere you hear men in their grief, and grief has come to me. I am wounded, Lord. My arm is on fire and the blood can't be staunched. My shoulder is so sore I cannot hold a steady spear and fight the enemy. Sarpedon is dead, my Lord, and Zeus will not save his own son. Heal my wound and deaden my pain and give me the strength to call the Lycians and urge them on to fight and to do battle myself about the body of my fallen comrade. Thus Glaucus' prayer, and Apollo heard him. He stilled his pain and staunched the dark blood that flowed from his wound. Glaucus felt the god's strength pulsing through him. 
glad that his prayers were so quickly answered. He rounded up the Lycian leaders and urged them to fight for Sarpedon's body, then went with long strides to the Trojans, to Polydamus, Agenor, Aeneas, and then saw Hector's bronze-strapped face went up to him and said levelly, Hector, you've abandoned your allies. We've been putting our lives on the line for you, far from our homes and loved ones, and you don't care enough to lend us aid. Sarpedon is down. Our great warlord, whose word in Lycia was Lycia's law, killed by Patroclus under Ares' prodding. Show some pride and fight for his body, or the Myrmidons will strip off his armor and defile his corpse in recompense for all the Greeks we have killed by the ships. This was almost too much for the Trojans. Sarpedon, though a foreigner, had been a mainstay of their city, the leader of a large force and its best fighter. Hector led them straight at the Greeks. For Sarpedon! The plain of Troy thrummed with the sound of bronze and hides stretched into shields, and of swords and spears knifing into these. Sarpedon's body was indistinguishable from the blood and grime and splintered spears that littered his body from head to foot. But if you have ever seen how flies cluster about the brewing milk pails on a dairy farm in the early summer, you will have some idea of the throng around Sarpedon's corpse. And not once did Zeus avert his luminous eyes from the combatants. All this time he looked down at them and pondered when Patroclus should die. Whether shining Hector should kill him then and there, in the conflict over godlike Sarpedon and strip the armor from his body, or whether he should live to destroy even more Trojans. And as he pondered, it seemed preferable that Achilles' splendid surrogate should once more drive the Trojans and bronze-helmed Hector back to the city and take many lives. And Hector felt it, felt his blood turn milky, and mounted his chariot, calling to the others to begin the retreat, that Zeus's scales were tipping. Not even the Lycians stayed, not with Sarpedon lying at the bottom of a pile of bodies that had fallen upon him in this node of war. The Greeks stripped at last the glowing bronze from Sarpedon's shoulders, and Patroclus gave it to some of his comrades to take back to the ships. Then Zeus turned to Apollo and said, Sun God, take our Sarpedon out of range, cleanse his wounds of all the clotted blood, and wash him in the river far away, and anoint him with our holy chrism, and wrap the body in a deathless shroud, and give him over to be taken swiftly by sleep and death to Lycia, where his people will give him burial with mound and stone as befits the dead. And Apollo went down from Ida, into the howling dust of war, and cleansed Sarpedon's wounds of all the blood, and washed him in the river far away, and anointed him with holy chrism, and wrapped his body in a deathless shroud, and gave him over to be taken swiftly by sleep and death to lick